Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. We are um, having people join our session. You've joined the session for the launch of the CAFAG Program Development Toolkit here um, at the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I'll just give um, one more minute, but we will, we will not try to wait um, very long. My name is Bridget Kennedy Feaster. I am a Senior Child Protection Specialist at UNICEF in New York, and I really welcome you to this, to this event. Um, actually, maybe I'll start with our housekeeping while we have people coming in. Um, again, I, I welcome you um, um, to today's event. We're very, very pleased uh, to be able to present to you this uh, program development toolkit on children associated with armed forces and armed groups. I'm gonna give a little outline of the event um, about what we're gonna to do today. Um, we're joined by Hani Mansourian, who will give us opening remarks. He co-chairs the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action and leads it broad, broad range of work, um, including a work of the task force for children associated with armed forces and armed groups, which is um, supporting this event. After that, we're going to have a session that describes the actual toolkit that we're launching today um, with our primary author, Sandra Magnon, and some colleagues from Iraq where the, the toolkit was field tested. We'll talk a little bit about their experience with that, and we'll have some opportunity to have um, questions and answers. So with that, I hope that was clear. Again, I'll say for people who have just joined, we have uh, interpretation in different languages in the far bottom right. Um, click on that, find your language, and join us to that. Um, we, it's now 9.04, so I will get started. Um, again, welcome, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Hani Mansurian um, for some opening remarks on the event from the uh, Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Hani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Brigitte, um, and everyone who has been involved in organizing this event. Uh, I welcome everyone who has joined, all the attendees uh, who have joined this, uh, the launch of these guidelines on CAFAG program development. Um, just a few numbers. In 2020, the United Nations verified the recruitment of, and use of uh, eight, over 8,500 children by, by 58 different armed groups in 22 different countries. And this, uh, this is not this practice is not only limited to countries that United Nations formally monitors, so the numbers are actually bigger. This number is unfortunately an increase from numbers that we have seen in the previous years. And this highlights the importance of, of these guidelines and this toolkit that we are launching today. This document fills a critical gap that existed in our sector for an interagency set of guidelines and tools that can support our colleagues in the field to prevent recruitment and respond to the needs of children who have been recruited in, in, into armed forces and groups. This document also complements the Paris Principles Steering group, uh, Group's operational handbook. This toolkit is meant to support practitioners with focus on quality, gender sensitivity, and participatory nature of program design and implementation. It is skillfully presented around the logic of program cycle to facilitate its use by program staff. The guidelines are complemented with practical examples from the field uh, and is also laid out in, a, in an accessible manner, which as we have learned um, in the Alliance helps significantly with the usability of such resources. One element that really stood out to me when I was reading the guidelines and therefore I thought I would, I would highlight it in my, in my remarks this, mor uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where, where, where you are, is the prominence of the, of the issue of prevention throughout this document. While this document adds a lot of value to the sector by documenting steps for CAFAC programming in terms of response, um, in terms of demobilization um, and reintegration of children, but it all also adds even more value in my opinion because it brings that, that issue of prevention um, uh, out uh, quite significantly. While I was reading uh, those segments, uh, I couldn't help but think about the story of Ahmed that a colleague of mine recounted for me a number of years ago. Ahmed was from Shahba in the Aleppo governance of, of Syria. In 2012, Ahmed was only 12 years old and together with his family, he was forced to flee their home due to conflict. And consequently, he was unable to attend formal school. 
But being a driven child that he was, he tried to continue learning from his older siblings and through informal school across the different places he lived during their, their repeated displacements. In 2015, when he was able to go back to formal school, he was asked to go back to grade seven as he didn't have any certification for learning that he had done since 2012. Uh, but he didn't want to be sitting in, in class with 12 year olds. He was a proud 15 year old boy now. He, he started weighing his options. He looked at possibility of work, which didn't exist at the time. School was, he thought is not an option for him. And every day it seemed to him that joining one of the armed, armed groups in the region might be his best option. Until he came across a small local NGO, interestingly a child protection NGO, um, that had started a certification program for children just like him. They looked at this issue of, that relates to education as a child protection issue, and, and he was able to join the program and soon was able to sit in classes that were more appropriate to his age, and he went on to graduate high school a few years later. Ahmed could have been recruited and could have gone through horrendous experience of violence. While reintegration programs are there to address issues of children like Ahmed who may join uh, armed forces and groups, but they can never undo the damage that has been done to these children. They can never erase the memory of the violent acts of that children observe or have to commit themselves when directly involved in armed, armed conflict. But prevention can help them not have to experience this to begin with. And Ahmed never had to experience them. This is the power of prevention. Before I close, I wanted to, um, to thank everyone who has been involved in the development of this really valuable document. In particular, I want to thank Plan International and UNICEF who co-lead the CAFAD task force of the Alliance. Additionally, I want to, to thank all the members of the task force and those who contributed to the development of this, this toolkit at different stages and in different ways. Also to mention that this document would not have been launched today if it was not for the generous support of the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, the US Agency for International Development, and the Swiss International Development Cooperation Agency. And most importantly, I wanted to thank Sandra, who masterfully authored and shepherded the process, which has been very complex, and it always is. So thanks, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the really interesting content that has been planned for you in this launch. Over to you, Kenneth, uh, Bridget. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hani, for your remarks. And I second um, the kudos to Sandra Magnon, of course, or really our principal author, who's really um, through uh, the changes in field testing due to COVID, many different iterations of what had, had to happen. Really, really pleased that we're able to support this and we've got to this point. So with that, let me give a short introduction of Sandra. She is a CAFAC advisor working with Plan International. She's led the research and the development of the technical note on girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. So that was one of the bases that was used for this, um, this tool, this set of tools, and as well um, the CAFAC development toolkit, uh, program development toolkit. She is currently co-lead of the CAFAC task force along with um, with me right now, although we hopefully will be transitioning to a new lead shortly. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sandra, for, for presentation on the tool so that our practitioners can understand what it is, how they can use it, how it can be helpful. Many thanks, over to you. Thank you. So I'll share my screen. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to see so many people joining us today for the launch of the CAFAC Program Development Toolkit. So this is the latest resource that the CAFAC Task Force has developed under the leadership of UNICEF and Plan International. So in this toolkit, you will find various resources. You will find some guidelines on how to design programs for CAFAG, some um, training resources with a training guide with PowerPoint presentations and handouts to facilitate a training, and some tools to contextualize. This toolkit has been piloted in four countries over the course of last year. 
So namely in Burkina Faso, in Central African Republic, in Afghanistan partially, and in Iraq. So in each country, we implemented a context analysis, a five-day training with field practitioners, and I provided some remote technical support. So the context analysis includes various methodologies. It includes a risk assessment, a gender analysis, a needs assessment, a stakeholder analysis, and the consultation of former CAFAG. So this will allow field practitioners to have a comprehensive understanding of the situation of children, of recruitment, the trends in exceeding harm forces among groups, and also the challenges that children face in their uh, reintegration. So this is an overview of the structure of the toolkit. So as Hani mentioned, uh, this follows the project cycle steps. So we start with some background information. So information about CAFAG, what is CAFAG, the forms of recruitment, the risk factors, the roles they can play, and also information about the legal and normative framework. And this was actually specifically requested by the field practitioners that participated to a survey uh, that we conducted before the start of this toolkit. So we asked uh, close to 200 practitioners around the world working with CAFAG, what do they want to see in this toolkit? And one of the things they mentioned was having information on legal and normative framework in a simplified way, easily accessible to people who don't have a legal background. The second step, of this toolkit focuses on the context analysis. That includes four phases, three phases. We have the planning, the getting ready, and the implementation. So in this step, you will find resources to train your enumerators, to collect information, collect data, to code data, and to analyze it. The third step focuses on program design and strategic planning. This is to me almost like the most important step of this toolkit. This is where we guide, uh, we guide you in how to take this data that you have collected during the context analysis and translate it into actual programming. So here you will learn how to develop a program on prevention, on the release and identification of children and on their reintegration. You will also find resources on monitoring, so how to develop indicators and a performance and measurement framework. There are resources on, on how to plan for your human resources and how to develop a budget. The fourth step, includes um, implementation and monitoring. So here we focus on the child safeguarding, how to set up the right environment for children so they are safe. Some uh, information on data protection. We know that the CAFAG data is extremely sensitive and then we need to protect them. Also on the monitoring of the implementation of your program and that includes a child-friendly feedback mechanism how to manage your human resources in terms of recruitment, learning and development, and also in terms of coordination with other actors. The last step focuses on the learning and evaluation. Here, we uh, really encourage field practitioners to generate and document learning. There are a lot of great initiatives, really interesting and innovative programs, some lessons learned on how to work with a particular group of children or how to engage with a particular arm group that then can be documented and shared with others. And, and we can all collectively learn uh, from each other. And the last point is on evaluation. So here there are some a short guidance on how to conduct an evaluation also involving children. 
So this was like a quick overview of the content of the toolkit, the guidelines and the training materials follows the same uh, structure. Now I would like to highlight some key elements that are cross-cutting throughout the toolkit. And the first one is how to design gender sensitive programs. So this toolkit will give you the resources to develop gender sensitive programs. When I did the survey, the research for the, the technical note on girls, I realized that too often the programs for CAFAG are designed with boys in mind. So what I mean is like the prevention strategies, the mechanism for release, the reintegration programs, they're all designed with boys in mind, mainly because girls are less visible because they're not well documented. So this toolkit will give you the resources, the tools to document specifically the situation of girls and boys. We have questions for both. You will also find resources to conduct a gender analysis, and that will give you some information on gender norms and recommendations to address the needs of girls that are mainly coming from the technical note. And I'd like to illustrate uh, my point to share with you an example from Central African Republic. There we have conducted a context analysis during the pilot uh, phase, and we have uh, involved some girls who were formerly associated. And we asked them a few questions. One of them was about the roles that they play in, in during their association. And you know, we often think about girls as playing roles such as domestic task and or being the wife of a, of a fighter, which is true. And they also mentioned those roles. But in addition to that, they mentioned that they were the commander's wife, that they were carrying and cleaning weapons. They were translators, they were hairdresser. They were also in charge of executing prisoners, transporting corpses cleaning ropes that were used to hang and torture people. So they provide like a variety of, of details that, that really highlights like the, all the roles that they play that is a lot more than just domestic task. And, and I think that's important to document so then we can program more effectively. This will have implications on their integration. They also mentioned some of the obstacles to their exit of armed groups. And they mentioned that in the armed group, they felt respected. As the wife of the chef, for example, they had responsibilities that were acknowledged. They also received dignity kits to manage their menstruation. And that was highlighted by them as one of the key reasons why they didn't want to leave armed group, because they knew as soon as they were back in their communities, they will no longer be respected. And also they wouldn't have the means to manage their menstruations. How invaluable this information is. I was just blown away when I, when I read this. And how this then this information can be used by organizations to program, to facilitate that release, encourage girls to leave by giving them the means, preparing the community so they can address the needs of girls that are actually better addressed within the armed group than within the community in sense. Um, another example is from South Sudan, where in 2017, the, um, they used to identify about 1% of girls among the CAFAG. And after they changed their, their orientation, the, the way they were identifying children after they started to train women in how to safely identify these girls who were often hidden, uh, considered as dependents of fighters. They were able to increase the number of girls from 1% to 35%. So again, like this is another example of how gender sensitive programs help you to to, to include girls, to reach out to them uh, in contexts where they, they tend to hide. So when, you, when your programs are gender blind and don't address those needs of girls, we actually take the risk to leave the girls behind. 
The second key element that I wanted to share, also cross-cutting throughout this toolkit, is the participatory approach. Um, that is uh, present in the context analysis where we engage community members, so it's men, women, boys and girls from the communities, but also former, uh, former CAFAG. And um, I'd like this, I'd like to highlight here how important it is to involve children. And too often as child protection actors, we, we shy away from collecting data from children. We know the risk of, of doing harm and, and we rather not uh, collect any data from children uh, because we don't wanna you know, cause any harm. But actually, if we take the time to set all the safeguardings, to have all the safeguardings in place. If we take the time to train people, to identify those who are going to collect um, data from children, then we can do it safely. And then the quality of data that we're collecting is so much more valuable than any data we will collect from adults talking about the situation of children. So with this toolkit, you will find resources. Um, so there are key informant interviews, there are focus group discussions, and there are also uh, session plans of mini workshops to conduct with former CAFAG, with all the measures to take to do it safely and um, to really encourage getting all those information from, from CAFAG directly. We also uh, developed um, culturally sensitive indicators with the involvement of the community and uh, the children. And there, um, what we do is basically when you have those indicators that we all have, right? So like number of children uh, released from arm groups, number of children reintegrated. What does it mean to be uh, reintegrated? What does it mean to be released from an arm group? Does it mean that you no longer work for the arm group? Or does it mean you no longer feel you're part of the own group? That's not the same thing. And the perception can be different from one country to another. Same on the reintegration. What does it mean to be successfully reintegrated? So we ask children, what does it mean to you? And then they prioritize those key attributes that then are taken as criteria to measure your indicators on reintegration. And I'd like to highlight some of the key elements we collected through the context analysis that then will inform programming. So we can start with prevention. In Central African Republic, the CAFAG, we asked former CAFAG, and they highlighted some risk factors that led to their recruitment. They mentioned the desire to feel respected, the need to protect themselves or their families, the need to meet their basic needs of food and the lack of schools, the lack of vocational training opportunities. So these are like risk factors that then can be addressed to effectively prevent recruitment. In terms of release in Afghanistan during the context analysis, we documented that actually the release was extremely challenging. Actually very few children were leaving armed groups and those who did, it seems, benefited from support from the community leader and their family who collectively negotiated the release with the armed group leader. So again, very interesting information coming directly from the community. And this can inform your uh, release program um, and, and expand this, uh, this approach. In terms of integration in Burkina Faso, there we ask uh, the community, what are the things you're already doing to support children who are coming back? And 21 uh, community members out of 30 highlighted that the community is already providing psychosocial support to the children and that nine of them said that they are providing financial support to those children. So there, it's, it seems there are already community initiatives that are in place that can be leveraged by the, um, the humanitarian actors 
to reinforce what is already there instead of coming with like a whole program that will then lead to um, to dependence on uh, on humanitarian aid so rather leveraging existing initiatives so this is just a, a quick uh, overview of some of the key data we were able to collect through the context analysis and the last point i'd like to make in terms of like this key elements that you'll find throughout the toolkit is contextualization. This toolkit is not about, this is the type of activity that you need to do in your context. It's more giving you a framework um, that then needs to be contextualized. So you will have uh, the legal framework that uh, the one you'll find in the toolkit is related to the international legal framework but then you need to contextualize it to the national legal framework. What does it say in your country? The data collection tools also need to be adapted in terms of the language to make sure the questions are not too sensitive. In terms of program design, there you will find uh, more of a methodology rather than exactly what you need to do. So the methodology follows those four steps. We start with organizing the data, so the data you have collected during the context analysis. You organize it like in a table. Then you consider some key approaches that are, that are different for prevention, for release, and for reintegration. Then there are the development of objectives and outcomes. What do you want to achieve with this program? And then only you brainstorm interventions. And there you will find a list of examples of interventions that are coming from different places, from Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East. So there you can find uh, many interventions then to inspire from and see which one can be adapted to your context. And then when we conduct the training at the end of the five days, the participants leave with very practical tools. They leave with a lock frame that includes activities, objectives, outcomes on the prevention, the release, and the reintegration, as well as indicators that are contextualized um, to their uh, country. So this will then basically give them the outline of their program uh, so they can more easily develop a project document. So how can you use this toolkit? Well, the first thing you can do is to train your colleagues and partners. So you can only take part of it if it's only on the context analysis, on the legal framework, or you can conduct the, um, the entire five day long training. You can also conduct a context analysis. So if you want, for example, to update your understanding of a situation, you can design new programs for CAFAG or uh, adapt uh, existing ones. So there you have, you can actually even copy and paste indicators, outcomes, objectives from the log frame that is provided. You can also organize briefing sessions with a government representative. I know that, for example, some countries have already used um, the legal and normative framework to train government representatives on the rights of children and the importance to consider them as victims and not as perpetrators of violence. You can also use this toolkit to engage other sectors. This multi-sectoral approach is really important. It's, it's mentioned in the prevention and also in the reintegration. And there you can advocate to the other sectors and engage them in the design of uh, the program. And the last thing you can do is to advocate to your donors. So here you can advocate for longer period of funding. We know that programs that are less than one year focusing on CAFARG are less likely to be effective. You can advocate for gender sensitive programs for uh, funding to the context analysis, and also for triple nexus. So this is in line with the multi-sectoral approach. Triple nexus means that humanitarian actors, development actors, and the peace actors all together work to prevent the recruitment of children. 
and facilitate their reintegration. So what are the next steps? Um, with this toolkit is now available in English and French. So you will find the, the link in, in the chat where you can download the resources. It will be also translated in Spanish and Arabic that will be available within the next two weeks. And then we're planning to roll out uh, this toolkit in three countries. They are not selected yet, so we're going to start the application process soon. And we're also planning to adapt the training package, which is um, currently designed more for face-to-face -face type of training. Uh, we're going to develop a MOOC from it. So like with the support of the LND working group, we're going to adapt this uh, training package into a MOOC so that we can reach um, a lot more people, including people sitting more at regional and global levels. Thank you. Back to you, Bridget. Wonderful. Thank you for that very clear explanation, Sandra, and, and, and a lot of detail that I hope will be useful um, to, to our colleagues. So I'm going to turn it over for a brief um, uh, comments from uh, or presentation from two colleagues in Iraq, um, who, uh, which, as I think you mentioned, well, the, the toolkit was field tested in, in Iraq was one of the countries. Um, so I want to turn it over to them. Um, it's Nibras Youssef uh, from UNICEF Iraq, the child protection officer with the office there, and as well, Simone Chicolin from Terre des Hommes, um, who's the Access to Justice Technical Coordinator. Um, I would turn it over to you, um, Nibras and Simone. Thank you, Bridget and colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, good. Great. Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. I'm with also a few colleagues here. We have uh, Jonita with us, the chief of section, and my colleagues as well, Katie Reis. She's working on the same agenda of CAG as well, and a few online colleagues from Iraq office as well. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, it is really a, a pleasure and an honor that Iraq uh, country office participated and supported uh, the toolkit and this launch, uh, and we were very lucky to be selected in the first place. Uh, so uh, my focus today will be on the context analyze, uh, together with uh, my colleague Simone, who also will talk about the legal part. Uh, but my focus will be most on the context analyze, you know, what are the feedbacks from our side, uh, you know, uh, what are the lesson learned, etc. So I will uh, put my presentation on. Is there? Okay. okay, let me first present. Go to Zoom. Yeah, I we can try to do the presentation if that's needed. There you go, Nibras, we're starting to see it. Good. Yeah. So as explained that uh, in Iraq, you know, we're lucky to participate. And also, um, unfortunately, that uh, Sandra was not able really to come for the workshop uh, in Iraq due to some, you know, uh, management issue. Uh, so we had also to co-facilitate and it was really benefiting. Uh, we learned a lot about it and, uh, 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 you know, uh, it was really useful for all of us and the reintegration actors. Um, for the background, as you can see, uh, the, uh, it was led by the CAFAC working group under the child protection uh, subcluster and also with support with the, uh, of the HQ. So the following organization have participated in the collection of data. Uh, it was UNICEF, IRC, World Child UK and Heartland Alliance. Uh, here are some of the methodologies. So we focused on, on, uh, on the gender, as also Sandra 
touched uh, base uh, a little bit on. So focused on the gender, on the stakeholders and consultation with former children uh, and I mean CAFAC. And that was really very, very important for us to have this participation of the children themselves, you know, to hear more from them about uh, what they've been through, what they think it will be working for them in all the uh, steps uh, of the process, uh, you know, identification, the release, the reintegration, all of that. So the tool uh, were used, it was uh, key informant interviews and focus group discussion. And there was also one online workshop. Uh, in total partners had, you know, conducted three workshops with 48 CAFAC uh, children and one stakeholders analysis with 10 participants in governorates because we also focus on, you know, these governorates were mostly uh, somehow uh, affected by the conflict, but also, you know, other where children also, you see recruitment, doesn't mean that there's conflict, but there was also uh, children being recruited, which is in Nainawa, Ambar, Babel, Mosul, and in this district within this governorate. Uh, Sinjar, Bashika, Telkef, Ramadi, Fallujah, and Mahmoudia. Here are some of the data. Uh, you can see number of people who participated. And it's disaggregated by women, men, boys, and girls. And obviously, you know, you see the number of girls, uh, why it is, you know, very low comparing to the others. And obviously, because we uh, know about, you know, Iraq, it's one of the location where you see a lot of culture sensitivity, uh, sensi sensitivity uh, you know, and, and you know, uh, sometimes for them could be recruitment, it's more about uh, the role of, you know, having uh, uh, direct uh, participation in combatant, uh, all of that, but we still, you know, see a lot of uh, uh, information there in the context analysis about the role of girls, how they were participated, and how it is different from uh, one art group to another. Um, here we see how are the children, you know, were recruited uh, in, you know, in armed actors and armed groups. So, uh, in, one of the reason we see is that family, uh, some of the family members were already part of the armed group or armed actors. So you see, children were motivated to participate and also get involved in that. Either it is believing it or you know, of, of different reason of it, or sometimes you see a lot of their friends, uh, age, uh, uh, same age uh, or peers, they participated also or joined our group. So you'd see that also was another way of them to join. Some of them also, they were affected by, you know, the, the religious, uh, the religion, uh, you know, there was a fatwa in Iraq for those who know uh, at that time to defend uh, ISIL. There was a fatwa by a particular group, and many children would see they joined uh, the armed actors and armed group at that time. Um, another one is voluntarily to take revenge. As I said, some, you know, in conflict, obviously, many people get killed. So many of their relative family members were killed. So you'd see many of them would voluntarily join just to take revenge, you know, that uh, feel that anger in them motivated by armed actors. So, you know, also uh, it is another way how armed actors would, you know, pursue the children, uh, you know, motivate them by giving money, position, power, etc. all of that <clears throat> by giving to the children. So you'd see a lot of children joined uh, as they were motivated uh, by the armed actors or armed groups. Here we see the risk factors. Uh, the risk factors, uh, you know, you see the, the lack of, uh, you know, economic opportunities. Uh, you know, many of these areas were affected by the conflict. And even in the first day, there was not really that much uh, economic opportunities for these boys. So you see, a lot of them that uh, uh, they were at risk of, of join or risk of being recruitment. Out of school boys, 
uh, ignorance of the implication to help armed groups, temptation of money, as mentioned, that motivated them, uh, desire to take revenge, radicalized and army mentality, uh, extreme religious idea that's also, you know, we could see in some of the armed groups more than the others, uh, psychological distress, fear of re retaliation by armed forces and armed groups. That's also another thing, you know, they were looking for protecting themselves by joining, making sure that there will be no retaliation against them. <clears throat> for girls, Poverty, lack of economy, similar to the boys, out of school as well, uh, desire to take revenge and bad friends or under pressure. These were mostly, you know, the risk factors of uh, uh, that were, you know, uh, reflecting or affecting the boys and girls. Yeah, here are also some of the protection factors that also uh, we, you know, as a result of the context analyzing, talking to the boys and girls, so life skills for adolescent, decision-making skills, moderation in religious uh, discourse, setting future uh, ambitious uh, goals to achieve in life. So all these, you know, they were also mentioned uh, during the... Uh, interviews or focus group discussion with the boys and girls. Here we see, you know, uh, also wanted to share with you how the release and what does mean, you know, for the case of Iraq, it may be different from other countries. Uh, you know, we all know previous program of CAFAG, there is a formal or informal release. Uh, but these groups and, uh, and uh, forces in Iraq, you know, they didn't have really a kind of like very formal release process. So it was different from child to a child. And that's also affected the risk and protection factors as well. For example, for the ISIL Islamic State in Iraq, there was not, re not really a, a, an official ceremony of releasing these children. But mostly, you know, because it comes to end the conflict and they end up in, in detention. For popular mobilization forces, you know, uh, that also was a, a, a bit different. There was no a ceremony, you know, celebrating, you know, the release, etc. But also, you know, when it come to end, the role was uh, we could see less less involvement of, of the boys and girls. Uh, for Iraqi security forces, similar, you know, there was also because of, you know, a uh, few cases. Uh, uh, for PKK, we see also that was a different because there is no also um, a really release process for the, for the children. We see a lot of these children would go and, you know, uh, sometimes end up there, never come back. So that's also was different. It's different from, you know, maybe some countries and, you know, the DDR program, et cetera, how they release the children. These are some, uh, you know, obstacles they were facing during, you know, uh, the release. Uh, Nibras, can I ask you just to speed up a little bit, if possible, yeah, so we have yeah. enough time? Thank you. So, thank you. So you see these some of the obstacles, and you also see, you know, they were linked also to the risk factor. For example, finding a job, uh, go out like they used to, you know, that's even increased when they were released from these armed actors or armed group. Also, uh, death threats, you know, by the organization, either to them or their family. Uh, for example, fear of being homeless or economic, because there was also intensive and money salaries. Uh, for social stigma uh, from friends, you know, they were looked, some of the children, depending on the group they were joined, they were looked as a heroes. Some of them, they were looked as, you know, uh, victims uh, or perpetrators. So that's also different. So for them, that was also some of the obstacles. Uh, listen, learn. I think it's very important. Uh, we learned that the participation of the children to give their feedback by their language, what does it mean for them, you know, to be joining? What are the risk factors? Um, you know, the mentality, also the, the, the point Sandra mentioned about if they are still part of that group, even if they are not participating now, 
in armed activity, but are they still mentally? Because for them, some of them, when they joined, it was joined by belief, you know, and, and it is a, a way of living their life. So it was not really disconnected from the armed group itself. But for them, when I, you know, it was that also really helped us a lot of understanding uh, this issue. Make sure uh, different age groups are part of the process. You know, also the age group, it was really important to differentiate between them and separate them. Uh, make sure facilitators are well trained and guided. Uh, pre, during uh, uh, the process, even if they are child protection actors, as Sandra also mentioned, it was really, uh, we could see that detail in the toolkit that, uh, you know, it made a balance of do not harm, but also make balance that, you know, um, the participation is there, but within that training and guiding the practitioners on how to do it before that and also during the process and thanks to Sandra who was step by step with us uh, uh, even if she was not in the country in person. Children may still have mental connection to the armed group as I uh, explained in the previous point. Uh, that's it uh, all from my side and um, if you have any, any question uh, there is also one point I wanted also to add that some of the uh, some of the solutions that also when you know put it there by by the children for the participant you know also involvement of religious leaders etc uh, all of that but uh, due to time we couldn't uh, put it here as well but thank you and uh, over to you if you have any questions. Thank you, Nibras. Simone, over to you for any comments to, to add from your perspective. Thank you, Nibras. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you to the UNICEF and the Alliance for uh, involving TDH in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this exercise in the development of this toolkit. Um, as TDH Lausanne, we are very happy and proud to have contributed in development of the toolkit. And I would like to thank, as I said, UNICEF and the Alliance for reaching out to local and international partners in Iraq to support in this process. I think that the first positive outcome was the consultative process itself, which, which led to the um, development of the toolkit. We really appreciated the consultation with the partners and the technical support that we have received. Um, the, process, the process established in Iraq was very positive and um, was a posi very positive coordination experience. Um, the lens technical support, as uh, Nibras mentioned before, has been present uh, in the whole process and reinforced the technique and was reinforced by the technical capacity uh, that UNICEF has in the, in the country and that TDH and the other organization have put in place. Um, we also felt that we have learned a lot by being part of this common engagement in particular focusing on the context analysis while organizing the round table with the children uh, during the preparatory workshop and the training with the, the overall uh, coordination has been uh, very participated and really strengthened the partner capacity throughout the process. Uh, I also feel that because of the combination of the international and the field expertise that was put in place, um, we feel that the toolkit is a very uh, practical uh, and adaptable uh, and is adaptable to different contexts. Um, we know very well, as TDH Lausanne and also the other NGO, uh, that we are looking always for the most effective way to translate the international standard, international principle, in, um, and this is strategic to advance the programming and the partnership with other national international actors. Um, with the development of this toolkit, we think that uh, we, with the Alliance, we have moved in this direction. Uh, because now we have a clear guideline providing everyone an harmonized and practical language and approach supporting inclusive and comprehensive programming for GAFA. Uh, during the training, the participant really appreciated the opportunity of discussing and also visualize the wording of the indicators, the activity, uh, the participatory methodology, and all the tools that are needed to develop programs around GAFA. Um, this brought a lot of clarity on how to develop high quality and technically strong intervention in all areas of CAFAC programming, as was mentioned before, including prevention, release, and integration. Uh, what also came out uh, um, 
as of primary importance is the is to refresh and update the knowledge of the professional in the field and in particular on the legal framework protecting CAFAG and prohibiting the recruitment and the use of children in armed forces and armed, uh, by armed forces and armed groups uh, during the training uh, one of the sessions that was highly requested and raised a lot of questions itself was the one on the that included the legal framework it was providing the principle and the legal instrument uh, and the standard guiding the program, programming to support CAFAG. Uh, personally, I was also a bit skeptical at the beginning on having a training session only on the international and national uh, legal framework, uh, mainly because uh, in, not all the participants have always a legal background or it might sound sometimes too specific or even boring to focus uh, in the, on the legal part. But actually, um, on the contrary, we discovered that during the training, the participant really showed a lot of interest in understanding exactly uh, what are the legal tools that they could use in Iraq to advance the intervention and to advocate for an increase, uh, to increase the protection of CAFAC. Uh, the, prof the professional attending the training had all a uh, high level of capacity, especially in terms of programming of CAFAC, and they showed a good knowledge of the methodologies and use, uh, methodologies and tools used to provide practical support um, and how to uh, provide direct services to children. However, it was greatly appreciated, um, in particular having the opportunity of highlighting the linkage between the instruments, the legal instrument, and how they can be applied to their programming. Um, yeah, this is what I wanted to add. Uh, I think that we are really looking forward to see how the toolkit will be used and implemented in the field uh, by the other organization and the community of practice of child protection and, and for CAFAT specifically. Um, yeah, that's all. Many thanks. Simone, for your for your uh, contribution today, uh, very helpful to hear how how it's you know where the interests lied with the different tools. Um, so we we are uh, coming up on our our time. I think we have time for one possibly one question before we go to our our speaker. I know that um, our, our closing remarks. I know that Sandra has been trying to answer questions in the, the Q and A section. So please look there for your answers. Um, I wanted to potentially just ask one question to you, um, to you, Sandra, um, um, on behalf of. Uh, I think I think I have a question in. Um, wait a minute. Now I'm looking for my different uh, things. Q and A and chat. Um, from from French, what are the steps observed in the process of withdrawal of children from armed forces and armed groups? Do you have anything you can talk about that in terms of the program cycle and this toolkit? Hmm. Right, not an easy question. Um, so in terms of the release, we see two key approaches. One is the, um, what we call like a formal release, right? So it goes for the armed actors, um, often like uh, armed state actors, who will, uh, will negotiate with um, the non-state armed actors the liberation or the separation of children. So that's a very formal process, uh, involves the government, uh, armed actors, and so on. The second process, which we see uh, more and more, uh, particularly for girls, uh, this is the one they tend to prefer, is like the informal process. So this is when children actually leave armed groups, whether by themselves, so like they escape, they uh, present themselves uh, directly to, um, to the local authorities, when they are captured uh, by, the, by the army, so like all those different other ways. And we see that more and more, uh, and less of this very structured kind of formal way of demobilizing children. Um, we see like the, the, the practice and particularly, um, again, for girls, girls don't want to be identified. So those very formal process, they tend to shy away and quietly go back to their communities. So this means for us in terms of child protection actors, how can we identify those children once they are already back in their communities? And this is where we need to involve community-based mechanism, the child protection um, um, uh, communities, uh, committees, for example, or other ways working with service providers on how to train them and so they can safely identify children. So these are the different ways uh, that then we need to uh, to develop. Super. Thank you. 
And I think uh, what I wanted to say, I'm going to turn over now um, and first thank you all colleagues, Nibras, Sandra, Simone, Hani, for your remarks. I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Landis from the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs in USAID, but I wanted to mention to everyone that the CAFAG Task Force of the Alliance has a community of practice, and we'll put that in the chat. There's a, if you can join that, you'll find out more information. You can have a conversation with Sandra, with other your, with your peers about these issues that you've raised that we have not been able to answer in the chat. Um, and, and also about the next steps for the toolkit, how you can access it, um, how your country um, uh, colleagues and programs can, um, can actually hopefully participate or apply to participate in, in the, the next phase. With that, um, thank you to everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Landis, as I mentioned, um, uh, representing USAID, BHA, thank you so much for your support for this process and all the support um, from uh, from your um, from the American people and USAID um, for this type of work, a really critical issue for us at UNICEF and across the world. Over to you, Debbie. Oh, thank you so much, and, and hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. And on behalf of USAID and the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, we are really excited about the launch of this new toolkit. We would especially like to thank Plan International, UNICEF, the Alliance, as well as all of the many people throughout the world who participated and made this possible. Across the world, we know that children associated with armed forces and armed groups face multiple risk and ensuring that they receive appropriate care and rehabilitation is an urgent priority. And yet we also know, as we've discussed on this call, that the process of implementing effective response interventions is invariably complex. For example, programmatic needs vary significantly based on the nature of a particular conflict, the ways in which children are involved, whether or not they're boys or girls, and many other factors in children's lives, families, and communities. As a result, we know that one size fits all approaches are not effective and that significant work is really needed in order to know how to, under, to, how to respond effectively. As a result of these issues, BHA has devoted considerable resources in recent years regarding how to protect and care for children affected by armed conflict and to make sure there's evidence-based approaches and tools in place. We've also heard from partners that the global child protection community lacked practical tools to respond to these needs. And so we are particularly pleased to see the launch of this toolkit. This toolkit is also particularly valuable by using a socio-ecological approach to prevention and response, as well as its emphasis on data, not only to shape program interventions, but to engage in rigorous monitoring and evaluation activities. By piloting and adapting this toolkit in diverse settings, the global child protection community has the opportunity to better understand ways to address the needs of children affected by armed conflict and also how programming can be strengthened and overall quality improved. Although the development of this toolkit is now complete, we know that now the real work begins as organizations and partners test and roll it out. And we look forward to the learning that will take place. So on behalf of BHA and USAID, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to talking further with you all in the months to come. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you so much to colleagues. Um, really wanted to say um, thank you to, to all of the places that the, the colleagues that we were able to, in the countries we were able to, to do the field testing. I think that contribution across different types of contexts really, really did inform um, the development of the tool, the refinement of the tools. So with that, I, I wanna close, but I just wanna remind you, please do join our community of practice. Um, we will be um, in the coming months, weeks and months, looking to um, circulate uh, to you, to colleagues around the world, um, other opportunities in relation to this. But if you join the community of practice, you'll also have access to other tools, other items. We have been doing some work um, as a community, um, for example, on mental health and psychosocial support for CAFAG, which I saw was a question. So there are other resources there you might be able to get, um, get your answers to. But until then, um, have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. Thank you for joining us um, and, and hope that we can connect soon on these important issues. Thank you.